These newspaper article readings are not for the faint-hearted or the squeamish. If you're at all sensitive, I might suggest these aren't for you. Um, if in doubt, check the description below. It'll tell you which topics are covered in this particular episode. Uh, there is both human and animal suicides, and you heard that right. Um, there's also horrific descriptions of injuries, uh, as well as the deaths of youngsters. Um, so don't do it to yourself if you're prone to nightmares, is all I'll say right now. Not all the articles are horrible. Some of them are uplifting, some of them show incredible bravery and heroism. Um, there are near misses. Uh, so these are picked as showing life prior to health and safety, uh, as well as for the crazy and curious details some contain with uh, other miscellaneous happenings um, that kind of struck me enough to uh, post the articles um, to Twitter, uh, despite not having too much relevance to Scotland necessarily. Um, these are worldwide topics. Uh, and. They didn't have any real connection to the projects that I was working on and researching at the time. I just happened to have come across them, by the way, kind of thing. So, uh, we'll get into them, shall we? What we're going to do here is we're going to do a lucky dip of newspaper articles to really mix them up a wee bit. Because while I'm doing the research is... I'm obviously coming up with the same kind of terms and things. So, uh, we'll mix them up even further. So to that end I have all of the newspaper titles and dates of the articles. Okay, so first today we have... The Scotsman for the 9th of April, 1906. Alright, so this one is interesting. We have from Naples, April the 8th, 7am. The central crater of Vesuvius is again vomiting forth enormous quantities of lava and the flames are shooting up to the height of 450 feet. Each explosion is followed by subterranean rumblings and by earthquake shocks which are distinctly felt in the villages at the foot of the mountain. At 30 minutes past 12 this morning, a slight shock of earthquake was felt here, and a second was experienced at 10 minutes past 2. Both disturbances were accompanied by rumblings, some houses were shaken, and many persons took refuge in open spaces. Showers of cinders have been falling incessantly at Otehano since 20 minutes to 12 last night. The inhabitants are gathering in the church. 8 a.m. Many fresh fissures have appeared on the slopes of Vesuvius and further damage has been done to Cook's funicular railway. At Terzino, a lava stream has begun to flow again and heavy rumblings have been heard at Otehano. The village of Bosco Tracas is surrounded by lava. Some of the inhabitants have been injured. Panic prevails at Torre di Greco and the townspeople, as well as those of Pertici, have demanded the resumption of the tramway service so that they may be able to escape to Naples if necessary. The authorities have consented to keep the cars in readiness. San Sebastiano is also in some danger. Naples, April 8, 5.30pm the station of Circum on the Vesuvius Railway is crowded with refugees from the Vesuvius district. The railway between Pompeii and Naples is cut. The lava has reached the cemetery at Torre Annunziata, interrupting railway traffic. Attempts are being made to resume the service wherever possible. Two warships have left for Torre de Erico to remove the inhabitants. A well-stocked relief train has left for Otahano. Many of the inhabitants of Torre Annunziata have arrived at Naples. The Duke of Aosta has taken over command of the troops maintaining order. The mayor of Santa Anastasia telegraphs that very dense showers of cinders are falling, damaging the fields and considerably alarming the population. The mayor of Soma Basumiana telegraphs the same effect, reporting a very heavy rain of fire and that continual rumblings are heard. At San Giuseppe, Several houses have collapsed and it is feared that some lives have been lost. 
Naples, April 8th, 6pm. All telegraphic and telephonic communication with Torre Annunciata is interrupted. Ten artillery wagons have arrived with refugees from that town. They report that the flood of lava, after flowing through a villa, divided into two streams, one running towards Pompeii, while the others threatening the business quarter of Torre Annunciata. More than half the population has fled. The main river of lava is within 800 yards of the town. Military engineers are working with feverish haste in an endeavour to divert the stream. Dense clouds of smoke and ashes shut out all view of Vesuvius, Capri and Sorrento. And that's from the Scotsman, 9th of April, 1906. And... I had no idea that Vesuvius had erupted so recently. I don't know that I knew it had erupted since the destruction of Pompeii. Um, I, I hadn't seen any news reports or documentaries or anything regarding it. So this article really struck me as um, just super interesting, I guess. Just crazy to think. But, well, there you go. So, next we have The Caledonian Mercury, one of my favourite papers, for the 16th of November, 1848. So this is a much older article than we've been discussing recently. Let's find out what it gives us. This article has cholera in Glasgow. We regret to learn that three other cases of Asiatic cholera have occurred in different parts of the city, all of which have proved fatal. The first case occurred in the forenoon of Sabbath at Burnbank, a tenement on the Great Western Road, the patient being a jobbing gardener of the name of John Gordon. It is stated that the man had the misfortune to have a very dissipated wife who, during the past week, allowed her husband to go without his regular meals, and to this circumstance is attributed the origin of the disease. On the fact being reported to the authorities, the chief superintendent visited the spot and gave instructions to have the man properly attended to, and also all the adjacent houses fumigated, which was done in the course of the afternoon. And that's from the Caledonian Mercury for the 16th of November, 1848. So, is that not a warning to wives everywhere? Better make sure your husband eats a regular meal or he'll get cholera and he'll die. Apparently, according to the experts in Glasgow. So, um, I don't know that I'm on board with that diagnosis. Let's see what we have next. The Dundee Evening Telegraph, 2nd of September, 1902. All right, this is a crazy article. So it's entitled, Train in a Tornado, Passengers Killed and Injured. New York, August 31st. A train on the Chicago and Northwestern Railway consisting of an engine, two luggage vans and two crowded passenger carriages was struck by a tornado near Meriden, Minnesota, yesterday. The engine remained on the line, but the baggage car was lifted bodily, the coupling wrenched apart and the car piled up in a heap at the foot of the embankment 18 feet below. The passenger carriages followed. In an instant they were picked up, held high in the air for a moment, and then hurled with tremendous force onto the wrecked baggage car. Two persons are known to have been killed and several are missing, while over a score are seriously injured. The day had become dark and the night brakeman was lighting his lamps at the time of the accident. The wreckage caught fire, but some cool-headed passengers extinguished the flames before beginning the work of rescue. The train was running at a speed of 35 miles an hour when the engine driver saw a funnel-shaped mass following it. He put on extra speed, but it was impossible to outrun the tornado. That's from the Daily Mail. Reported in the Dundee Evening Telegraph, the 2nd of September, 1902. 
I mean, just imagining that is crazy. Being part of it, being a witness to or actually on board one of, one of the carriages. Oh, my words. That's that's a, just a crazy, freaky thing to happen. Like, you can see why that article grabbed me, right? So, yeah. I think we might have time for a fourth article this time around. So let's see. We have the Edinburgh Evening News for the 8th of September, 1902. Okay, so we have another transportation accident. It's entitled Runaway Cars in Glasgow Streets, Disastrous Collision, Car Goes Through a Shop Window, One Person Killed, 27 Hurt. A distressing accident occurred on Saturday night in Renfield Street, the steepest tramway gradient in Glasgow, resulting in the death of one person and injuries to 27 others. A well-filled trolley car from Postle Park had reached the top of the Renfield Street incline and the driver was about to apply his brake at the stopping place there when the pin, from some unexplained cause, came out of the handle causing the latter to come off and the driver to overbalance himself. The next instant, the car started to descend the hill up which it had already travelled, and although the conductor attempted to utilise the brake at his end, the rush of passengers to jump off caused him to be pushed away, and within a few seconds the car was rushing downhill at the rate of 20 miles an hour, the speed increasing every moment. The street was crowded at the time, and there was a general effort to get out of the way of the oncoming tram, which cleared the level junction of Sucky Hall Street at the pace of a railway train, and while about to descend the other portion of Renfield Street, dashed into a Pollock Shields car with tremendous force. The effect of the impact was to send the other car dashing down Renfield Street. The terror-stricken passengers endeavoured to save themselves by jumping from the flying trams as best as they could, many receiving injuries in doing so. On nearing the West Regent Street crossing, both vehicles collided with a Deniston car which had been coming up the hill, and the three locked together sped onward. They jumped the points at St Vincent Street where one of them crossed into a stationer's shop kept by Mr William Lorimer. Twelve yards of pavement were torn up and a street lamp was demolished. The effect of overrunning the points was to bring the cars to a standstill, but, fortunately, neither overturned by the sudden stoppage. The onlookers immediately rushed to the assistance of those who remained on the cars, and for some moments a scene of confusion and excitement ensued as the work of rescue was begun, amid the screams and groans of the passengers, many of whom were women. It was at once evident that the casualties were numerous, and the ambulance station having been notified of the accident, ambulances and medical assistance were quickly forthcoming. Though no one was killed outright, Mrs Johnston of 40 Napiers Hall Street, Glasgow, was so shockingly hurt that she succumbed a quarter of an hour after admission to the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. It was ascertained that at least 26 persons were injured, the greater portion sustaining cuts about the head shock to the system, and bruises to the legs. That's from the Edinburgh Evening News, 8th of September, 1902. And that could have been far worse. An accident that took in three tram cars from different parts of Glasgow ended up in the middle of that. And for only one fatality to have been the result, I might consider a win, really. Pedestrians must have just taking that to be a completely crazy happening in front of them. I, mean, I can't even really imagine it in my head happening, knowing the streets, but yeah, well, there we go. Um, yeah, I don't know that that was the only time that happened. I think I, I've come across other tram accidents that were along the same kind of lines, but that one's obviously struck me enough that I've posted it for people. So that ends our newspaper lucky dip for today um, and we may see you next time.